Cool. Thank you. We'll um, we'll have the applause later, maybe if the drinks work. But um, um, so I'm going to talk to you today about um, a bit of real time vendor agnostic personalised chatbot services, AWS. A bit about the Internet of Things. A bit about conversation design. Um, I'm head of mobile and this thing called a cognitive architect. Um, I like delivering complex IT solutions. It's the bit that gets me interesting. So if someone gives me a challenge and says, um, can you do this? Of course you can. Um, I've been doing this kind of thing for 30 years. Um, and I do find it interesting about connecting things that people say they can't be connected together, um, which is kind of why I've ended up doing some of this stuff. Um, we are, um, for those of you who don't know BGSS, it's the only BGSS slide in here. Um, the UK's largest privately owned IT consultancy, been around 25 years. I joined four years ago, um, 400 people, we've just gone over 1,200. Um, Bristol office has now got about 120 and we've just um, outgrown our office and having to move to a new one. So um, really quite exciting and, and uh, we do some really cool techie things. Um, who's it for today? So cognitive architects, developers, conversation designer, any Bristol techies that might be out there in the audience maybe? Uh, um, and I've already said what we're going to be doing and talking about. Um, and I'm going to do a real-life demonstration of Brigitte the Barbot, um, voice-activated IoT-connected cocktail maker. Um, assuming my Google Home is still alive, which I'm presuming she is. Yeah, there you go. Um, there's Brigitte. <coughs> Brigitte the Barbot. We'll demo her later. Um, a bit of a um, chatbot accelerator and, and the art of the possible. So a vision of, of where chatbot should be going, um, personalised conversations. Um, chatbot evolution. Most, most chatbots that you probably see around today um, are probably in the first two levels. Simple FAQ bots, um, which really aren't very good as soon as you start going off piste. Um, you're starting to see some nice complex FAQ bots. So they can start handling things like when you say, I love you, they'll actually deal with it in a proper response, but really not very good. Um, chatbots should be able to answer everything and they should always bring you back onto that conversation. So for instance, if you, someone does say, I love you, it's well, I'm someone that's in the cloud or whatever, but these are the things I can help you with. Setting expectations for chatbots is really important. Um, what I'm starting to do, um, I've been putting together enterprise level chatbots for probably about four years now. Um, and it's all about the personalization. It's all about real time conversations. Um, going away from just the cost to serve, it's how do I, for a business, get increased revenue and loyalty. But how do I, as a client um, or as a person using it, actually have a really good user experience? Um, user experience, as with everything we should be delivering as, as, as developers, user experience is really, really important. And we need to think about that now. And how do we do that in a way that um, will allow us to, to get these real personalized conversational bots? Um, Bot Networks 2020, um, it's not there yet. I'm starting to do um, master bot, slave bots. So, so you go into a top level bot and you get routed down to, to bots. But there are discussions um, in the industry at the moment about what happens if I can't answer the question? How do I have an engine that says I will route my, my question to someone else and get them to answer it? 
Um, it has a load of potentially ethical um, considerations. Let's say I have a bot that's dealing with counselling a child for whatever reason, and, I, and, and something comes along, I can't answer it, and I send it off to someone else, um, and they say, I'll just go and jump off a bridge. <laughs> uh, and that child jumps off a bridge. Who, whose responsibility is it? Is it me or the, or the original owner of that chatbot? Or is it someone else that, 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 that I have to then track it through? What about privacy, GDPR, PII, and all those things? How do I handle that when I start routing information across to, to other networks? Um, so let's just, just backtrack a bit about why on earth and what, do, what is a bot and what do I need to do? So uh, an example, a real example of a simple user story. So um, what's my balance at the end of the month? Quite a simple question. Um, in order to do that, I potentially need to understand the question, so I need some natural language processing. I need to potentially do some predictive algorithms, uh, some machine learning. I need to take some big data, so I need to take data about you, find that data, and push it back to your machine learning, NLP, et cetera. Um, that potentially, I think, is AI. I think AI in that top box is incorrect. The solution as a solution as a whole is probably AI, which uses a set of services in order to deliver that. So for instance, NLP on its own is not AI, um, but that's probably an AI solution at the end of the day. Um, how do I deliver that? Um, most people that think about chatbots today will say, look, I can deliver a chatbot um, and I can go to Dialogflow, I can go to Alexa directly and I can do a chatbot. Sure, you can. Um, but it's probably not the way you need to be thinking about going. Uh, and, and, and I'll hopefully explain some of that as we go through. But at the heart of a chatbot should be a conversational engine. Um, that engine will basically do all that personalization and that real-time responses. But in order to do that, it needs a set of really good services. So it needs natural language engines. It needs emotional services. It needs sentiment analysis service. It needs context. Context is really important. So, so there's, there's short-term context and there's long-term context. So if I take short-term context, an example is I go into a flower shop. Um, what do you want? I want you want... Um, Flowers or chocolate? So I'll have some flowers, please. What type? I'd like some roses. What colour? Blue. Now, if that was a real shop, when I walked in next week, the, uh, the salesperson would say, oh, that person ordered blue roses. No one orders blue roses. So that's my short-term context. But if I then take that to, well, actually, on Valentine's Day, I like white roses. So I need to be able to store the short-term context about the conversation today, but also some of that long-term context at the back end to that says, on Valentine's Day, I always order white roses, so that when I start talking to the conversational assistant, whether that's by voice or text or whatever, it really doesn't matter what the front end is, I still get that, um, that long-term context. I've pushed out fulfillment here. This is what fulfillment is the bit that actually says, here's the response. Most chatbots today, what you'll do, who is BJSS, and you'll get a standard response, BJSS is an IT consultancy, blah, 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 blah. Um, and it should be personalized. In order to do that, what we need to do is we need to use a natural language engine for what it's good at, which is natural language matching the intents, and we take fulfillment back into the organization to be able to personalize those responses. So if I think of an example, um, I did so, uh, some work in the States um, to be able to take children from the age of 14 to get them to the right university on the right course to get them to start, to get them to complete and get to a job at the end of it using a load of big data. So I started potentially with a 14 year old and I ended with a 22 year old or something. Conversationally, I speak very, very differently to a 14 year old to a 25 year old. So I need to be able to personalize that and that's where fulfillment comes in. It's the heart of the conversational engine. In order to deliver this, then we need a real set of services and there are lots of services out there to do. So we have an abstraction layer that basically says I abstract those services onto real services. So whether it's Google Dialogflow, whether it's some of the open source natural language engines like snips.ai, um, nlp.js, um, or whether it's Microsoft services, or potentially if you go to another country, I might want to use claire.ai in Japan. Um, it really doesn't matter, but I abstract those out. Data is really important, of course. Multi-channel access, it shouldn't matter what channel I'm accessing. I come into the conversational engine and it manages it for me. That way, potentially, I can say, look, here's my conversational interface. I'm going to hook it up to Slack. I haven't got to change anything other than the front-end connector. External API, surprise, surprise, I need to be able to talk to. Rich analytics over the top of the whole platform. But in order to do this type of thing, you need to take the conversations out 
of the particular NLP services. So most NLP services have their own conversation designers allowing you to do quite a lot of stuff. Here's some FAQs, here's some nice flows, but they don't deal with the, the, the stuff about what happens when it goes off piste. How do I do the personalization, etc.? So what we do is we take the conversations out, starting to put them into a conversational CMS. If you can put the conversations in a CMS and then have an abstraction layer on to deliver it into any of those services, it means I can use any NLP engine I can use any of the other services and I can switch between them as time goes on. There's a reason for this. So um, based on the work I've done um, for the past two, three years, we are developing, we have developed an enterprise grade conversational platform. It is aimed at enterprises, but at the heart of it is a reference architecture. We're looking to open source the developer version of it as well. So this will be an open source platform. That key part in the middle will be open sourced allowing you to deliver those real conversations, We're developing a CMS on the front of end of it, conversational CMS that will dump data into it, but again, you could use your own, your own, own CMS, um, and, and an accelerator platform that will allow you to deli deliver onto any platform. So it'll run locally, or it'll run in AWS, it'll run in Azure, it'll run in AliCloud, it'll run in Kubernetes, Docker, it really doesn't matter. Um, I'm gonna go into a bit about why you would want to do this. Um, there's a load of business requirements. I'm not going to go in much into those. It's not, not the audience for that. But there is, how do I do sign-off, legal, approval? How do I do the security around all my conversations? How do I handle GDPR and privacy? Do I have to anonymize all my conversations before I send them to a natural language engine? Yes, I do. Um, I don't want to be sending bank account numbers, email addresses, anything that could potentially identify people to other NLP platforms that they could then reuse. Um, how do I handle really, really good conversational analytics linked to a change control process that says people are asking these questions, there's a problem here, so let's get it in the backlog and let's get those conversations updated. But then again, how do we, why don't we deliver chatbot solutions in the same way we do any other enterprise delivery? Why can't I do things like A-B testing? Why can't I do blue-green deployments? Why can't I test everything locally before I hand it off? So this platform will allow us to do that proper CI pipeline, the proper assurance, the proper A-B testing, et cetera, before we actually deploy. More importantly, though, AI is still maturing. Um, it is a rapidly changing market. Small providers being bought out. Um, one example, uh, in the States, I was told by a board, please go and use this NLP engine because they're amazing, a company called Poolstring. And they were, they had a really, really good conversational um, engine. I went and saw the CTO of the organization. He said, don't touch us with the barge pole. And he said, don't know why. He wouldn't tell me why. So I went back to the board saying, can't use them. Um, Monday morning, Paul String made an announcement. They said, we've decided we're not doing chat any longer. We're only going to do voice. Um, you've got 14 days termination of service to get off our platform. At that point, you know, what am I doing? If I'd chosen Pull String as my chat vendor, my NLP vendor, I would now have a solution that in 14 days wouldn't be working. The other part of it is technologies are evolving rapidly. So you might decide, look, IBM Watson is great today, Dialogflow is great today, or whatever, I don't really mind. Um, is it going to be great tomorrow? Do you want to have an NLP, NLP engine that maybe is going to be open source tomorrow and I can bring that into the platform? So don't get tied into AI solutions that you're going to get tied into. Give yourself a platform allowing to move as time moves. Okay. Um, so heart of the platform should be something like this. Um, conversational design are completely separate. Um, a core engine, deployable and usal, usable locally but deployed with all the tools allowing you to use it through a CI-CD pipeline. So you can download stuff, you can test it locally, you can run the conversations, you can do all the things you want to do locally, and then you want to be able to say, I want to spin it up to a deployment platform. So my deployment flash platform, is it AWS? Is it AWS native? Is it Azure native? Is it Kubernetes running in eChaos or something? It really shouldn't matter. You just choose the deployment platform choose the NLP engine, you choose the sentiment service, you choose the language check provider, all as extra different services. You choose which channel connectors you want, so browser, Slack, Facebook, whatever it is. Each of these is standard connectors, you can say, you can just deliver. And 
based on a set of templates. So within the organization, you take all your conversational stuff, you have templates, you have my small talk for the template. Here is my template that allows me to spin up a bot. By having an architecture like this, this potentially says that if I'm running on Dialogflow today on AWS, by pressing a button, half an hour later, I can be running exactly the same platform on Azure, running on synapse.ai. So as AI changes, I choose the platform I want. <coughs> but I'll look at this in a, a bit further detail. Um, this is how it abs actually abstracts out onto an AWS service. So at the heart of it is um, an orchestration of step functions. Um, really doesn't matter what those services are. These are some of the core services that, that, that we use. First part, of course, it is anonymization. How do I anonymize my data to make sure there's no PII data before I actually send anything out? Language identification, it may well be this is a multilingual um, service, so how do I identify the language? We use, in this case, AWS Comprehend. Here's the, here's, here's the anonymized content. I think you're speaking in Japanese, I'm going to send you to this version of the agent. I think you're speaking in German, I'm going to send you to this version, uh, version of the agent. NLP engines, again, choose which one you want, and it may be different countries use different NLP engines. So I might have one single conversational flow in the content designer that supports multiple languages, and then different NLP engines that support that. So I could be talking through one conversational flow in German, and I go off to dialogue flow. However, in Cant in, in, if I'm speaking in Cantonese, I'll go off to Claire.ai, but with one single CMS platform. Take the data back, we manage content, we manage entities. So entities is my name is Tim Walpole at BGSS. Oh, sorry, Tim Walpole, my email address is this, that's an entity, and we keep that and store it. In order to, to, to access this, um, we actually use the I IoT. So IoT with the MQTT protocol gives you a really, really good socket connection at really low cost. So if I want um, a socket connection with guaranteed delivery of messages in both directions, um, AWS IoT, I think it's two million messages of, is a fiver. It's incredibly quick. So my whole stack from front, front end all the way through that orchestration of services through the IoT, front to back, 1.2 seconds, which is, which is actually too fast, so I need to slug my bot and make it feel like an, I'm a human at the other end because people don't like chatbots that are too quick for some reason. Maybe the you know, next generation down they will, but we don't. Um, what if I want to put live agent into it? So I've got sentiment analysis here. Um, conversation seems to be not working. I'm going to show you a demonstration at the end using one of the new Google perspective APIs. If I can understand that things are not working, either at the conversational level, um, or potentially if I take that up a level, I can then say, seems to me that things are not working, let me hand you to a live agent. If I do that in the conversational engine here, it means whether I'm talking on my mobile device or Alexa or Google Home or it really doesn't matter, I can be transferred off to a live agent to carry on my conversation without changing anything in the platform. Multi-channel, of course, at the front end. So as long as you can talk MQTT or um, uh, standard, standard, uh, you know, whatever, Facebook, um, Google, etc. Federated identities, so we use Google, uh, so Cognito, so whether it's Facebook or authentication or uh, SAML, OpenID, it really doesn't matter. Um, gives you access to the content. So, before we go and do some demos, um, conversation design. This is, this is the hardest part of putting a chatbot together. We can do the tech, we can spin this stuff up, we can get some stuff, but without a really good conversational design, um, it's not going to work. Um, what's the tone of voice for my bot? It's potentially different in different languages. Um, does it have to handle small talk? Yes, it does. Um, there's no getting around it. You either deal with it saying, I can't answer that question, or what is the small talk of my bot, even down to the, you know, I love you or whatever. It needs to have a standard way that says, this is my tone of voice, this is how I'm going to talk to you, and this is how I'm going to get you back on track. Um, handles FAQs, fulfillment, personalization we've talked about, um, multi-language we've talked about. Um, Bots should not be a, a, a clippy, Microsoft clippy sitting in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. Bots should be something that become integrated into your UI UX. So as you're going through maybe a screen on a web page, that bot becomes a nudging engine, something to help you and guide you, something to give you information. 
it gives you it in a way that is easy for you to use. So does it have quick replies? Yes, probably. But you also need to be able to type it as well. How many bots do you go to actually, there's a quick reply and it says yes, and if you type yes, it doesn't work. Um, think about those type of things as you're putting these together. How do you handle failure? Um, and how do you delegate to other responses? So I'm going to show you delegation in a minute, but, but handling failure is really, really important. So how do you have a platform that basically, so as an example, I'd like to move some money. Well, which account would you like to move it to um, from my current account? Which one savings account? How much would you like to transfer? So it's now expecting a number, you know, a thousand pounds or something like that. What happens if I say um, how much is in my current account? Most systems that are trying to get a piece of information will just fail at that point, saying, I'm sorry, I'm trying to find out how much you want to transfer. Well, but if you handle that delegate, that, that, that failure, and basically say, well, it failed, but what I'll try and do is reprocess that. Can I handle that question? How much is in my current account? Yes, I can. Go off and do it. Put it in a stack about what you were doing before. Do what you did, and then come back and say, just to let you know, you were transferring some money. How much do you want to transfer? So handling failure is really important. What happens if you fail too many times in a conversation? It seems to be we're going down here and it's failing and it's failing and it's failing. It seems to be you're not working very well. Would you like me to transfer you across to a human agent? You're now starting to get a bot that really is starting to be a conversational bot and is helping the person rather than you getting frustrated and never using the bot again. Um, conversation design. Um, Three years of, of working with conversation design, I started designing conversations with great big trees of things, and you very, very soon get completely stuck with large conversations. How do you put those type of things into a CMS um, is almost impossible. This is a conversation lifecycle that works for any conversation and allows you to take conversations and put them as a single row in a, in, in a CMS. It basically goes like this. In order to handle a conversation, the first thing you need to do is you need to elicit the intent. What is the intent? Um, so it might be, I want a pizza. Okay, So it's the pizza intent. In order to provide a pizza, I need to um, do some slot filling. These are standard NLP terms. So what type of crust do you want? What type of toppings do you want? I might have come in right at the beginning and said, I want a pizza with ham and cheese and tomatoes or whatever it is. I could have pre-filled those slots. So I'd miss that section out. Um, I then come in and say, just to confirm you want whatever pizza it is. And then I've only really got two choices to get out of this. One is um, if you've got your one-click pizza ordering, which I think is probably quite scary as you come home, I want a cheese and ham pizza, and right, it's on its way. Um, <laughs> that'd be quite nice, though, wouldn't it? Um, there's your finish, right, I finished the conversation, or I delegate to another intent, and I start the process again. And delegation might be, well, I'm going to send you off to the billing intent. It might be delegation via context. I might know something about you that says, oh, it's Valentine's Day, I'm going to send you down the white rose route or whatever it is. But you can delegate um, at that point, and you literally start the process again. That will handle any single conversation that you can throw at it as a single line in a CMS. And as such, we can deliver a CMS that allows us to drive complex conversations because of the delegation route, because of the handling failure, um, which the back end supports. So if I take that one step further, we then add other bits into it. So if I've got my detecting intent, I use your user session, I use your context, I use the conversational CMS that we've got all those conversations in. I use machine learning services that I might want to put in the platform to decide what to do. I use the sentiment analysis. Is it going in the right direction? Are you unhappy? Are you angry? I use anything else that I know about you based on what you've asked to redrive the personalized response and then either say, here's your personalized response based on what I know about you and what you've asked, or in the case, here's a live agent or something like that. So by using all those bits together, we start getting really, really good conversations. Doesn't really matter which engine it is. We've talked about that. It could be Dialogflow, SNPs, AWS. I don't care. Um, and there will be another one out, out out there next year, I'm sure, which I will be looking at. Right. BJSS Barbot. <laughs> um, this was it was 2016. We had a hackathon. Um, 
to try and put together this bar bot. It emulates the bar, Barendo 2003 Kickstarter project. Um, it's got a Raspberry Pi on there somewhere. It's got an Arduino and Mega as the processor. Um, we built it over two days, including the mobile application that goes with it. Um, and it's sat in, sat in the, the, the basement of, our, uh, of the, the, the London office. And we res re resurrected it about two weeks ago, thinking um, IoT would be a cool thing to do. Um, so it's resurrected. Um, I'm going to show you the architecture. Um, we've now IoT enabled it. It's hooked up to the accelerator, um, BGSS accelerator. It's, um, we can talk to it via Slack, and we can talk to it if things work down there by voice. Um, voice demos are never very good. But um, heart of it, um, there's a bar bot over there somewhere running on a Raspberry Pi, which has got an API connection. What we've done over that API connection is we've spun up um, uh, an IoT service. Um, so we've got an IoT listener, listens to messages. In this case, we're using AWS IoT. We've used the chatbot accelerator to push all the messages in. So what, basically what I do from my chatbot accelerator is I call an API that says send a message to the bar bot, throws it into IoT, picks it up on the IoT listener as long as, long as the network's working, um, and pours your drink. Um, there's also drinks recipes and on thing there, um, but there you go. Um, why on earth did we do this? Um, IoT is really interesting. Um, how do we, how do we, it, trying to come up with innovative solutions that sow some of this tech uh, is quite hard. So what we try and do is rather than just look, here's an IoT device and this is it working, it's how do I put all of this stuff together to show the power of some of this stuff. We were just having a conversation earlier about um, the next bit is I want to put some machine learning in this to say, I'm going to ask, you, I, want to, I want a cocktail, um, fine, what type of coffee do you drink? And based on the questions of that and some machine learning stuff, I'm going to say, based on the fact that you like um, lots of sugar in your coffee and you like seven shots of coffee, I'm going to recommend one of these. So a recommendation model. We've also started thinking about how do I use um, digital twins and things so I can understand, even if the bar bot is offline, what the status of it and things, and then do some updates offline and then send the information out. So it's some really cool stuff that allows us to do things like this. Um, so that's kind of what we've got, loads of, loads of data and things. So let's do some techie stuff. Um, the prerequisite. So I have already spun up the accelerator, the chatbot accelerator. It's deployed locally, so I'm running it locally on my, my box here. Um, and I've also got it spun in, up in AWS. Um, it takes about five minutes to run the whole thing. It's infrastructure as code. You can spin up the whole accelerator in about five minutes on to, onto AWS. First thing is I'm going to connect um, to our provisioning bot. Um, so let's, uh, I'm going to come out of here. And I'm going to have to share my screen, aren't I? Otherwise, nothing's going to happen. Um, where's my screen? So first thing we're going to do is we're going to connect to our provisioning bot. We're down in my provisioning bot. I'm going to go to my provisioning bot and I say I want a new bot. So the first thing, my provisioning bot running on AWS says what type of template you want to use. So I'm going to create my Barbot voice, and I'm going to call it BizTech Bot. Okay, so that has now spun me up already a version of the bot. And I go across to here, I look at my designer. Assuming my network is live. I'm not sure it is. <laughs> it should not be good. Okay. 
So this should be down here. My bridge tape. If I open that up, it's got my conversations that are already there. What we're going to do is we're now going to, I'm just going to go back to my slides to show you what we're going to do. So we've provisioned a new bot onto the platform using a template. What I want to now do is I want to connect that bot to Slack, just to show you how easy it is. So I'm going to drop back to some of the command line interface. And I'm going to list my bots. So here's my bots, and there's my BrizTech bot down here. And what we're going to do is we're just going to connect that to Slack. So here's my connect to Slack. In order to connect to Slack, I need the OAuth token that's sitting in the Slack. So let's wander back in here. We'll go into Slack. We'll go into my OAuth. I've already got, and we'll copy that. I'm hoping that's copied paste that one in. Which bot do I want to use? So there should be somewhere down in here, my BrizTech bot. You notice it's trained. So the first thing when I took my bot, it would have taken all the conversations, it would have thrown it up to the natural language engine and would have trained it. So the training is now done. And it's given me the endpoint. So there's my nice endpoint. <coughs> and I can put that back in here. Change the endpoint. And that's nicely verified. And I can save the changes. So if I now go to my Slack, I go into my bar bot. We'll just do reset as it's a new one. Now talking to Bridgie the bar bot. Okay, so really, really easy. And the integration, the vision is the integrations are all the same. I want to connect to Facebook. It should be that easy to connect a bot up. Okay, so next bit. Um, we've now connected the bot to Slack. I now want to connect that to Google Home. So what I'm going to do is I've already listed my bots, but I'm going to do it again because I need the bot ID. I'm going to grab the bot ID, which is this one. And I'm going to go to my... Dialog flow, and I've got a dialog flow. The way Google works is it basically sends everything to dialog flow, and then we've got a fulfillment engine off the back of the dialog flow. It sends all our conversations to um, the accelerator, to our bot, and we handle it. So Google dialog flow knows nothing about it. It's literally just a pass through. I'm going to update the bot ID in here. I just better refresh this first, seeing I've been on and off the network. We're going to pop this one back in here, and we're going to save. So what I've got now is basically I have hooked up my bot to this. Anything that's happening in here through, through my Google Home conversation-wise is going to go through to the new bot that we've just provisioned. And now we'll try one of these things. Um, hey, Google. Open BrizTech Brigitte. Hey Google, open BrizTech Brigitte. Here are some pictures that match. No! <laughs> <laughs> Told you, voice damage. It's like having a dog on stage, isn't it? <laughs> Let's try again. Hey Google, open BrizTech Brigitte. No. Showing pictures that match. <laughs> I'll type it in in a minute. Hey Google, open BrizTech Brigitte. Brick Brigitte. Here are some... That's why you don't do voice demos. Maybe the name is wrong. Could be. <laughs> it's not. Hey, Google, open BrizTech Brigitte. These pictures... One more, and then I'm <laughs> going to do it this way instead. Hey, Google, open BrizTech Brigitte. Sure. Here's the test version of BrizTech Brigitte. Hi there. My name is Bridget the Bristol Barber. Would you like me to make you a drink? Yes. Great news, smiley face. What type of drink would you like? Screwdriver. Good choice. I am going to make you a screwdriver. What size would you like? Large. 
Let's get the drink started. One large screwdriver coming up now. Smiley face. One large screwdriver. It's got no alcohol in though. <laughs> um, it will have alco alcohol in it when you come back to us later. So um, we're not allowed alcohol on the stage, which is a bit of a um, thingy, but there you go. Uh, <laughs> let's get rid of, okay. Um, so you've kind of seen what we've done. We've hooked up a load of clever tech. We've done some IoT stuff. Um, I'm gonna show you a quick sentiment analysis one as well. Um, uh, it's kind of interesting. So uh, we talked about sentiment analysis earlier. Um, what I've done is I've hooked up the new perspective um, uh, API from Google, which is in beta at the moment. Um, I've hooked it up to my Slack. Um, so I'm looking at the sentiment of all my Slack conversations um, in the organization, which is kind of interesting. Okay. Um, so what we'll do is I'm going to go to this one here. Here's my sentiment analysis service. My flirt bot. <laughs> I'm going to go to Chrome, which is my nice sort of bit over here. We'll just make this a bit smaller. We'll make it a bit bigger down here. Right, so I've got a sentiment Slack service. And I'm going to say, uh, I love you. Hello. <laughs> um, yeah, so it thinks I'm kind of uh, flirting with this bot. Um, flirting stuff, so I, I do actually want to create a flirt bot that the more you flirt with it, it will flirt back with you. And then I want to create an angry bot that says, if you're angry with me, I'll be really angry with you. But then I want to try the opposite. If I'm angry, can I make you less angry? Which is kind of an interesting. So it's one of the, one of the things I've given to our data scientists to try and try and come up with. Um, but you can say, look, um, I hate you. Um, I hate you. I want to kill you. I don't know if you can go down any of these. It's threat. It's toxic. It's attack on the commenter. It's you know. Um, it is really quite interesting. These services that are coming out, they're coming out for things like child abuse, bullying. They're really quite interesting. But we can use them put them in the tech, put them in that pipeline, come up with some really cool stuff that you can put in that pipeline that, that, that you can then use. And I'm nearly five minutes, I know, I know, I know I'm done. <laughs> I've, got, um, I've got about three more slides, I think. So, future of sentiment analysis, we've been there, we touched that. Um, and I think that's really cool. Not that bit. Thank you. How do you get involved in some of this stuff? Um, the important thing is start find a find a low risk biz, bit of the business that 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 you can understand how it works. Um, I'm working with a major um, mobile vendor that sends all of their conversations to live agents. So it's live chat. Um, we're taking one of their journeys, which is the ID verification journey, and putting it on a bot. They have um, a million conversations a month. They have 1,500 live agents, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Um, it's two minutes for the IDV journey. That's two million minutes a month saved on that one journey. It's 200 agents. That's a lot of time. But if you can find the journey that allows you to do that, um, AI is immature, still developing, so rapidly prototype. Get an accelerator of some kind. Um, and use it, run innovation sprints, try it, test it, get that full stack in, you need to use all these bits, you need to use some good UI, UX, natural language, big data, etc. Take a, an agile approach to delivery, get that MVP out, get testing, get trialing, and then you can start developing some really cool stuff. But in a way, because of a framework, it allows you to move with AI as it moves. Um, and my sli last slide, um, script writing is going to be the hardest bit, I've mentioned that. Um, but please um, think about the ethics of what you're doing. Most people don't mention this. Um, a simple example, um, if I'm talking to a bot, should I know I'm talking to a bot? If I transfer you to a human agent, should your bot tell you I'm transferring you to a human agent? It's now illegal in California to pretend to be a bot when you're not and vice versa. You must legally tell them. Um, there's an example of, I don't know if anyone's seen the handsome robotics dog. Um, it's got four legs, hasn't, does, doesn't look like a dog, but it acts like a dog. There was a, there was a YouTube video of someone kicking that dog. Um, and there was absolutely uproar saying you can't kick a dog. Well, I'm sorry, I can jump up and down on my phone, 
but why can't I kick a piece of electronics? It's very interesting how we're, how we sort of, um, we're driving the ethical side of this because it feels or acts like a human. Um, as a developer, it's really interesting. We are in a place now as developers that we are putting technology in that is going to affect generations and generations beyond us. So if we are putting in conversational interfaces, robots, etc., as developers, that will affect um, our children and our children's children. And, and I've never been in a position before in the industry where we as developers have such an impact on the future. And on that, it's over to questions. Questions? So uh, there's lots of great um, AI pieces in the in the whole story where you're doing machine learning, um, but it still seems that the actual the conversation design is very human. Um, can you comment maybe on where we are in that part of the journey and the feedback to almost sort of self-evolving uh, conversation design pieces? Yep. Yep. Um, uh, you're you are you are completely right. Um, uh, today, particularly for large organisations which are worried about legal and compliance, what my chatbot is doing is it answering the right questions. People want to say, um, "I have tested my bot and it works," and these are the conversations. Um, by putting in a proper assurance platform at the front end of it, um, having a platform that allows us to test those conversations before they go go live. Um, and monitor what is happening, we start getting to a place where actually we can drive that loop. So today the loop may well be, look, I'm taking conversations as they come in. I can't answer these. They go to a human and a human does stuff. I'm starting to write some machine learning models that look at the conversations and do some predictive analysis on those that says these are what I recommend we, how we update the model. At the moment, they're all human driven, so I take the recommendations and pass it in. When my recommendation model starts getting good enough, then I can start auto doing that. Because I've got the controls in place saying that I'm testing those conversations, and if they start straying outside the normal, then I stop my bot or it doesn't go live. Um, I think we're two years away from that, yeah. Um, probably. Um, I think you'll probably start seeing some now. It depends on the organization and, and the appetite for risk. Are you happy your bot becomes sexist, racist, whatever? Or doesn't um, what happens if yeah? What happens if something that was no, we uh, will never take responsibility suddenly becomes yes, we're completely liable. I don't know. You, you, there has to be some controls in place by putting that assurance platform in that will allow us to start to do that. That makes sense. Yeah. Any more questions? Stand silence. Yeah. Thank you again for that. It's great. My pleasure.